So this you guys conference can see my... will now be recorded. Okay. So you see my full screen, correct? Yeah. Now, how can you get the uh, a bigger picture of it? A bigger picture. Um, like the full screen? It's only at a partial screen for you guys. Uh, here we can. Go. We can still see each other, Joy. We're like in a group across the top. Okay, I just kind of okay. minimized you all, so hopefully you'll see what I see. If you go, if everybody goes to the top, right in the middle where it says, um, well, I'm not sure what it says on your screen. Um, if you go to, if you click on the arrows there and click hide everyone, Joy's screen gets bigger. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah, from the left. Oh, it's this thing. Mm. No. Are you ready? I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody. And Joy, feel free to unmute if you want. Okay. Everybody, can everybody uh, access the chat in case you need to get in touch with us? Mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to mute us all because there's a little bit of feedback or something and then Joy can start. Okay. Um and you can see my hair was a bit shorter back then when I took these photos. Um as I was mentioning earlier my husband and I went to New Zealand in the uh, last week of 2018 and the first two weeks of 2019, which is New Zealand summer. Uh, late spring to summer is what that is. Um, and uh, here you see this silver fern, as it's called, is the national symbol of New Zealand. You see it on their flag. Um, you might have heard of the All Blacks rugby team, and that uh, that's also their their logo and the silver fern we learned according to the Maori, the uh, indigenous people there, um, it, it grows very commonly, especially on the North Island. And at night it has a certain luminescence. So they used to um, drop them sort of like breadcrumbs in the forest to guide them back home in the dark. So that's the silver fern. Do you wanna sit next year? Okay, let's see if I can make this work. Here we go. All right, Kiora. Um, this is a this is a greeting, a traditional New Zealand greeting. Everyone says it, um, of uh, no matter their backgrounds, and it's a Maori term. Term. Uh, it basically means welcome. So when you meet anybody, instead of saying hi, they're very likely to say Kiora. Um, so, Kiora for tonight. Okay, I thought maybe a little geography would help because um, uh, to kind of give you an idea how big New Zealand is and kind of that there is a North and South Island. Um, they are not like yes. right next to one another. And um, the just so you can see on the lower left, you know, New Zealand would occupy about, you know, a big chunk of the Eastern United States. So that gives you some idea of distances. Um, and I'll have maps throughout here to kind of show you the major places where we were. So you have some idea of what our trip was. Um, a lot of people don't, unfortunately, don't make the time to go to the North Island. Um, and there's a little rivalry between these two islands. You know, South Island thinks it's better than, and, you know, you shouldn't bother with the North Island. And I think the North Island thinks it's kind of hick land down in the South Island. So um, it's friendly. Um, it's a very temperate climate, I would say a lot like here. Um, and they have just about under about under 5 million people between the two islands. So it's quite small. And a third of those people live in Auckland in um, the most populous city. It's not the capital, but it is the most populous city. And that's likely where you would fly in. Um, most people come from a European descent, mostly England and Ireland. Um, 
Maori, the indigenous, some Asians and Pacific Islanders as well. And there is a Scottish influence as well. And the, uh, well, here, I'll get onto that in a minute. Next. Okay, so we flew into Auckland, which it took us about 12 hours from the West Coast. Uh, it's about the same from San Francisco or, or um, Los Angeles. Um, and I have to say that um, Air New Zealand is probably the best flight I've ever been on. Very clean. They, instead of having the little bottles of wine, they just come along with open wine bottles and refill you. And they always give you a little candy at the end. So it was very, it was quite, quite pleasant. Um, after we got to Auckland, we had about, uh, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half to wait. And then we had an hour and a half long flight along the west coast um, of the South Island. And it, it was the most beautiful flight I've ever seen. Um, you can see these are taken from the plane and you go all along the spine of um, western mountains in the South Island um, to land in Queenstown. Uh, which is really the, I would say, the adventure capital of, of New Zealand and, um, and beautiful in its own right. In fact, Queenstown is what you see on the bottom, that wide picture. That was taken right from our Airbnb balcony. Um, as soon as we got there, it was a gorgeous day. And this panorama probably is about a third of what you can see if you turn your head. So I didn't have a big enough my camera wouldn't do that, so I had to kind of crop it. Um, Queenstown is, is where you go to do all the thrill-seeking things. Uh, bungee jumping, it was actually invented in Queenstown. Hang gliding, jet boats, parasailing, boating, hiking. Anything you'd want to do here is, is available, and it's growing um, pretty quickly. Okay, so... Um, after our morning arrival, we, we actually were meeting um, some friends. Uh, there were six of us who were doing a uh, four-day bike ride in New Zealand, and we met two of them. They, they insisted, you know, within six hours of us off our international flight to go on a wine tour, which um, it actually was a pretty good idea. It worked out okay. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't fall down in, in, our, in our glasses. Um, the Gibson Valley, as it's known, is about a half an hour um, from Queenstown. And it's a pretty, it's, it's got, I'm going to say about 12 wineries and, and really quite a, what I would call a vigorous um, wine region there. Um, I had heard personally about their Sauvignon Blancs. You may have heard of Kim Crawford, and that's a very popular and, and very well regarded Sauvignon Blanc uh, that's made in the Gibson Valley. Um, but I, what I didn't know about is that they make outstanding Pinot Noirs as well. And that was a really pleasant surprise. Um, so we went to about three wineries and, you, you know, we were going around by van and it was all very civilized and pleasant. Um, and at the bottom, those big fruits, um, they were in a place called Cromwell, which is, uh, I'm going to say, about an hour away um, from... Queenstown, and that's where we, that's close to where we began our bike ride. It's known as the fruit capital of uh, New Zealand, and they're very proud of their fruit, even though some of their fruit really didn't look like the fruit it was supposed to be. Okay, so this is the beginning of our, our bike trip, and like I said, there were six of us. Um, my, my husband and myself are, are in the middle. To the left are two people that we know from high school. Uh, one of them was our exchange student from Australia. So they joined us for some time. And then the other two young men are, or not such young men, are um, from the West Coast. So we all met here. And uh, I, I actually, the way this came about was the Australians were visiting us and uh, the year before. And they casually mentioned to the other two about this trip to New Zealand. And I said, well, what are, what are you talking about? And so they kind of said, well, we're doing a bike ride. And I said, well, don't they have like 14,000 foot mountains in New Zealand? And I said, oh yeah, but they got this rails to trails thing, it's flat. So they invited us to come and we took very little time to say yes. 
So you can see in the map kind of the area that we're talking about. This was 150 kilometers, which sounds like a lot, but it's about 30 miles a day, which is not at all unreasonable. Um, we had, uh, you know, it was all set up. It, was a, it wasn't a, a guided tour. We, we were on our own, but our luggage was taken from B&B &B to B&B, &B, and we didn't have to worry about it. Um, and we were happy with all the accommodations, and it was really a, a wonderful thing to do. Uh, we were very blessed with weather, too. We didn't have any bad weather. So, and very good maps. There were some tunnels on the way and a lot of bridges, and um, it was pretty easy going, except for once in a while there were headwinds, but it was it was really fine. It was not as hard as you might think it would be. I was afraid of, I was afraid it might be hard. 90 miles. Yeah, it's not it's not unreasonable. It just sounds like 150 kilometers sounds like a lot more than it is. Um, this is some typical scenery along the bike trail. This is the central Otago re region, which uh, a lot of the South Island is quite dry. Uh, and you can see that here, although they'd had a pretty wet spring. I mean, I think they were up something like eight inches of rain. So um, it's actually greener than it would be normally. And a lot more wildflowers were coming out too. So we were we really lucked out. Um, a lot of sheep, a lot of these rocky outcroppings. Like I said, a couple tunnels, some of which were quite dark. I mean, we had headlights on, you know, and and uh, but it was it was beautiful scenery. Okay, so here's more pictures of Central Otago, um, and um, you know it, it, it was just stunning. I mean, this was a valley that opened up late on our trip with a, a, a stream going through it. Um, on the upper left is a picture of one of our Airbnb places or our Airbnb places, and as you can see, they were used to having American and Canadians come. And um, there's the All Blacks flag with the silver fern that you can see, which is New Zealand's rugby team. Um, and it was just, it was just lovely. It was, it was easy riding and just perfect weather. And I can't say enough about it. It was great. Okay, so Kiwis are pretty resourceful. And we got to this little town, which actually was a big town in this area because it was so small. Um, and uh, as you can see here, we've got the hairdresser, the tobacconist, the East Central Cafe. Did I miss anything? Yeah. So this was pretty typical that you'd see kind of, well, somebody who's just going to cover it all, whatever the local needs are. Um, and uh, as we're going along, that's kind of a stark picture with a dead tree in it. But um, every once in a while, I'd like to throw in a black and white. And then in the bottom, we're, we're coming out of this little town. and there's these things, you know, like on the fence. And we're like, what are those? And they were boar carcasses. So, and there must've been 20 of them, I'm gonna guess, you know? So if you look carefully, you can see, yeah, those are boars. They're not, they're not you uh -huh. know, cows or whatever. <laughs> but a little surprising, but you know, you're out in the country. And then this place, Oderahua uh, was a small, probably the smallest place we were at. Um, I looked up the population today. It's 112 today. Um, <laughs> and these are just some slice of life images. Oderahua was where we spent uh, New Year's Eve. And we kind of called ahead because we were afraid, well, do they have any food here? And they really didn't have much. They did have one cafe, but it was pretty much booked. and you know, so we ended up cooking for ourselves. But I did like the sign outside, which is alcohol, because no great stay ever began with a salad. Um, so the middle picture there of, of the rocket, um, I guess this was a tradition in this town, and we had to ask about it. Uh, but they, they have one of these big Estes rockets, and at 8 o'clock, they blow it off. So we made a point of going outside because this was our big New Year's celebration. And um, it, it promptly went up at eight o'clock. It went about 200 feet high into the clouds and that was it. So that's New <laughs> Year's in Oderahua. Um, what else? 
And to the left, this general store that they have, it was mostly a showpiece. I mean, this was like old matchbooks and old posters and stuff like that, which I guess were novelty items you might buy, but it, you know, there was there was hardly any food. There was mostly like ice cream bars. So I don't know where they got their food, but there it was a cute little place. And to the lower right, um, believe it or not, this can be typical housing in parts of the South Island in particular. Um, they're very resourceful, I found, with corrugated metal. Um, you saw a lot of it. They painted it. They used it for fencing, for, for siding, for roofs, for everything. And you can see there also there's two um, sizable water um, containers, too. Um, again, it's pretty dry. Pretty rickety. Together. Pretty rickety, yeah. And, and poor, too. Um, this was taken literally from the porch of one of our B&Bs, and we got this fabulous sunset, and it was just, you know, you just couldn't believe what you were seeing, basically. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't even know what to say about it. It just went on and on, and the clouds lit up, and um, central Otago has a lot of those very soft rolling hills, so it's very typical of that. And then um, a couple pictures of night skies that I took. Um, places in New Zealand are um, designated international dark sky areas, which I guess means you really can see a lot of stars. Um, on the right, that's actually Queenstown. Um, so that's why you've got the lights. But you can see even, even with a lot of lights, there's a lot of stars. Uh, and then the one to the left was taken in one of the dark sky areas. Um, and you know it was just it was just stunning. Um, the only trick was in the summertime, sort of like here, they actually like the sun really. I'm going to say they were about an hour different than where we are in terms of sunset. So the the sun really didn't set well until about 10:30. So I had to wait until like one o'clock in the morning for it to be dark enough to take these pictures, <laughs> um, and then. You know, I, I asked my husband, I said, he said, well, I wanted to get up and see him too. So he got up at about 3.30 and he said, and you could still see, you could start to see sun on the horizon. So pretty short nights, but it makes for lovely long evenings. And um, this is a New Zealand flag. You can kind of see um, an array of stars there called the Southern Cross. And uh, there's, it's also on the Australian flag, but I think they add what they call the pointer stars, which if you see in those circled areas is those two bright stars. And the Southern Cross is the, the, the larger circled area. It's kind of upside down. Um, it's really not a very bright constellation. You have to use those pointer stars to even find it. It would, it's even hard to see in the one with all the stars because there are so many stars, they drowned out, you know, the, the Southern Cross. Um, at the tail end of our ride, it was all very civilized. We, we returned our bikes. They gave us tokens and towels, and we were able to shower off because we'd just been riding and had all our luggage. And then they took a shuttle. They took us by a shuttle to, um, to this railroad, which is called, um, well, the name of the town was Pukarangi, I think. Um, and you can see it was Christmas. Uh, and then we took about an hour and a half train ride through this beautiful gorge called the, I think it's pronounced Tairi. Um, and that was just, uh, a wonderful capstone for the whole, for the whole bike ride. Um, I don't know how they, um, they, they blasted this all by hand. Um, I mean, they didn't blast it. They had to dig it, um, by hand and it's, it's quite, um, remarkable, the, the, you know, how you wind through this gorge. Um, on the lower right picture, you can kind of see a haze on some of those trees. And those are actually trees that are in blossom at that time. And they're Makuna trees. And you'll, if you go to New Zealand, um, and probably specialty stores around here, you'll see Makuna honey, um, which is very expensive and very specialized honey that comes from these trees. Now here's a picture of that I took right from the window 
were moving at a fast shutter speed. <laughs> um, and uh, this this uh, this whole gorge and the train ride winds down to um, Dunedin, which is on the east southeast coast of the South Island, which was our next stop. It's absolutely beautiful. And again, we had great weather. So this is one of the pictures of Dunedin. Um, we only had one full day there. And uh, just, uh, there's a place called the Otago Peninsula, uh, which is just south of the city. And uh, it kind of winds out. It's, it's just beautiful landscape. Um, and, you know, it's quite, it's quite high. It's quite hilly. And this is actually a botanical garden by a castle, a place called Larnick Castle at the top of one of these hills um, that was built, don't ask me how, because the winding roads going up here were, were narrow and hazardous. And I don't know how they got the building materials up here, but they did. So this is a very popular place to get married to. There's a little uh, uh, gazebo. And then these are other pictures of Dunedin. To the left was a train station which has a big Scottish influence. Um, and uh, for, we know we didn't go inside. We should have gone inside, but we never did. And we, you know, we never got back there. So, uh, but it, it looked like quite the, it's quite the structure. And then the Larnick Castle um, built by someone, I'm not sure, I guess Larnick. Um, you know, you can see the European influence here. Um, and that's where the botanical garden was. So, we continued to go all the way out to the end of this uh, Otago Peninsula, and there, there, for a specific purpose, there's some wildlife out there. And um, in addition to the royal albatross, which I'll talk about in a minute, there's some, I think they're called yellow-eyed seals that come in at mm, five o'clock, six o'clock, maybe. I'm not sure about that. It might be dusk. Um, but there are some interesting animals that lives out, live out there that you can observe. So the Royal Albatross uh, is, I think it's, I don't know if it's the largest bird in the world by wingspan, but it does have a 10 foot wingspan, which, you know, you can't get a sense of that looking at the, you know, it just looks kind of like a seagull, but um, they actually have a tendon that flips into place to hold up their wings because they soar and they set, they spend about, 85% of their time at sea. Um, so mostly they're flying or, you know, they'll, they'll rest on the water. Um, they can soar up to 75 miles an hour. And here they, about 30 mating pairs come every year to mate and raise their young. Um, and we did see them. They weren't too interesting because they were just kind of sitting on their nests, but we did see some flying. Uh, and these, these chicks take eight months before they're ready to fly. And I, they said that sometimes they will not, they will not see land again for three years. They'll be totally out to sea. So it was really fascinating to learn about these, these uh, albatross. Uh, after we left Dunedin, um, we kind of split up at that point. And um, my husband and I went to, we rented a car and went to a place called Nugget Point which is about an hour south of Dunedin. Um, it was a rainy day and um, it, it was pretty remote. This is actually a, um, very close to a, like a seaside area, a resort type area, but very small little places, you know, very comfortable. There was nothing, you know, Miami Beach about this at all. Um, and then you kind of walk up this winding path and it was pouring rain. And this is the outlook from the uh, the lighthouse there. Uh, and basically, your next stop is Antarctica from here. <laughs> this is basically where you are. So uh, it's quite dramatic. It's hard to capture it, uh, to, to give the, the scale of it in a photo. Here are another couple, you know, black and white versions. And you can see it's quite dramatic landscape here. Um, and it was very, very windy. Um, I had challenges taking pictures without having a lot of <laughs> a lot of water on my lens because the minute you turn the corner at that lighthouse, you're just slammed with a wind. So it wasn't the best day, but it was definitely um, it was well it was worth the trip. 
Um, this, these mountains or formations here along the coast are called the Chatlands. So we're kind of zipping now to the other side of the island, the South Island. Um, it seems like everything's about four hours away, two to four hours away in New Zealand from one another. Um, from Nugget Point, we had about a four hour drive maybe to, uh, not to Milford Sound, but to the town outside Milford Sound, about two hours away. Um, Milford Sound is a fjord and there's a lot of fjords at the south west corner really of the South Island. Um, Milford Sound is probably the most accessible one in terms of, you know, being able to get to it by road or boat. Um, and that's, those are about the only two ways. I think you can fly in there too, but only on good days. Um, Milford Sound has about, I think I read 300 days of rain a year. So it's very common that you see rain. And if you, if it's not, you know, you kind of go and you go, oh, I can't see the tops of the mountains. But what you do see on a rainy day are these pop-up waterfalls, which are just stunning. I mean, they're, they're amazing. And they told us, uh, you know, you take a boat ride out basically, and then kind of turn around and come back in. And um, if it's a sunny day, you can see the tops of the mountains, but there's only two permanent waterfalls here. So these are all induced by rain. And it was just um, a very magical place. Also, a place where they filmed a lot of Lord of the Rings, which was actually all over New Zealand, but definitely they did some of that work here. So here's uh, more of the really beautiful water, waterfalls there. Um, as you can see, the waterfalls actually kind of come down as mist sometimes and then form bigger ones. And on the right, you can see they also disappear into mist with like updrafts of wind going up. So they can also disappear. And it's, it's just incredible. They, they come down these, um, these huge cliffs. I mean, uh, what did I read? I think the highest peak in Milford Sound is 5,000 feet. But then the mountains technically go 1,600 feet down into the water. So, you know, it's just, it's, all I can say is it's a very magical place. Um, definitely try to get there if you can. It's generally a full day trip though, because it's it's remote. Um, we had to drive two hours in and two hours out and we were close. But if you came from Queenstown, typically people will take a bus and that's usually about a 12 or 14 hour day. Um, just to kind of you know, you stop along the way, you have your lunch, you know, that sort of thing. And it's it's a long day. It's a full day. Okay. More Milford Sound. As you can see, it's just gorgeous. Um, you can hike there, but I'm not sure how you hike there because I don't know how you get to these places. I mean, people do come in. Um, and as I mentioned, there's there's a whole series of fjords on the southwest side of New Zealand. Um, this one being the most accessible. Uh, but other ones, you know, you can get to them, but you might have to hike for like three days and then bring a kayak. You know, there's complications to getting to a lot of the other ones. So, um, that's why most people go to Milford Sound. Um, also, cruise ships can come in here. So if you're doing a cruise around New Zealand, you can stop in here as well. And everyone rides the boat. You know, it's, it's the only way to see it, <laughs> honestly. More pictures of Milford Sound, a little map where you can see where it is. Um, and I don't know if you can see it, you might have to look close, but Teano, is to the south and a little bit inland, and that's about two hours away by car. And then there's Queenstown, and you know you kind of got to go around that big horseshoe there. There's no pass through the mountains to get more directly there, and so I think it's probably a four-hour drive between Teano and Queenstown. So that's that's why your day gets so long. Um, New Zealand is on the Ring of Fire, 
uh, which you know is the volcanic ring that that goes around the Pacific. Um, and you'll learn a little more about earthquakes, but it is very volcanic there and very earthquakey. Um, and uh, this picture on the right was interesting. I think I have another. Yeah, they pointed this out. This is actually the place where the Australian and Pacific tectonic plates meet, um, which was pretty extraordinary to actually be able to see that and then to think, wow, a really big earthquake could happen any time right now, which is kind of the nature of New Zealand, but I guess they get used to it. We didn't have any, <laughs> we didn't feel any, um, but I'll tell you more about those later because there's other pictures. Um, after we spent a night back in Queenstown, uh, we drove for um, about two hours north to Mount Cook, which is the highest peak um, in New Zealand at about 14,000 feet. And along the way, we heard about this place. It was sort of like chimney bluffs on steroids, I would say. It was these, um, these clay cliffs called Omarama, and they were just natural cliffs about 20 minutes off the road. You could drive in and walk around in them. It was free um, and just gorgeous. You can see kind of in the upper left picture, that's my husband. So you can see how big these things are. Um, it's hard to, again, get a sense of scale, but they were, they were huge and just there. Um, on the way, driving to Mount Cook, you know, the mounts, the mountains begin to come around you. They begin to get higher. And um, you saw lupins, at least at this time of year, because um, that's a late spring flower. And they're not native to New Zealand, but they like living there. And they grow all over the roadsides. It's absolutely stunning. Um, they gave up trying to get rid of them. They, they were going to try, and they just said, forget it. These things are here for good. So... Um, we almost had an accident. There was someone who stopped their van literally in the middle of the road to take pictures of the lupins. You know, and we kind of came up on them after a hill. So not not advised. Um, on the way to Mount Cook, like I said, you kind of see the mountains getting higher around you. This is the Lindis Pass, which is a big sweeping view, and you can actually climb up there. We, we didn't climb very far. You can see in the top left there's a little color in that path, and that's a couple of people who went up part of the way, but you could go all the way up um, if you wanted to. We didn't have too much time. And these uh, these bushes are very characteristic of drier parts of New Zealand. They're, um, they're tussocks, and they have red tussocks, but I'm, I think these are just the regular ones, but you see them all over the place, and it's it's quite quite dramatic. Very nice drive. Um, we stayed over overnight at an Airbnb and then um, went the next day to Mount Cook. Um, this is a place where you can, there's a couple glaciers that you can take, well, you can hike them if you want, um, but you can take helicopter rides up there as long as the weather conditions are okay. We didn't do that. We chose to take about a three hour hike in. Um, the name of the trail was the Hooker Track. We kind of giggled about that, or my husband did. Um, and that brings you into, um, well, kind of close to the glacier at the base of Mount Cook. Um, it's, and it's a very easy, easy and well maintained walk. I'm going to say it's not really a hike, but it's a walk. Um, I think it took about three hours. Um, and that was in and back. And, um, in New Zealand, tracks are trails and tramping is hiking. Um, but that's not too hard to figure out. Um, this lake at the bottom literally was that turquoise color. Um, they have the most beautiful glacial lakes there. Um, and they have three very large ones, this being one of them. It's called Lake Pukaki. And they're um, cleverly, they, they have uh, created canals between them, not big ones, mostly kind of irrigation canals. But they actually they 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 use it for hydropower, but they also raise salmon, inland salmon there. So here in uh, you know an hour outside of Mount Cook, you can get fresh sushi. So it was really um, it was just the, the color was just stunning, and you could see this from the plane as well. 
so this picture on the upper right is your reward when you've hiked an hour and a half. And um, it's, it's pretty hard to see the glacier because it's so small now. And that's something you really notice is how, how small these glaciers have become. You can see kind of in that picture how there's gray going up the sides, maybe a third of the way up. Um, that used to be where the glacier was. And now that tiny little dirty area that has a little snow on it is all that's left. So, but at the end of this, there was kind of a, I should call it a glacial pond, um, where there were all these pieces of the glacier that had broken off and were melting. So the water was freezing cold. And, um, but you know, you just come upon this and it's, a, again, a very magical place. And um, there were like these three Frenchmen who decided to get down to their skivvies and actually go out to that big chunk of ice out there. I, I don't know how they stood it. They wasn't around, but yeah, they were lying down there and taking pictures and all that stuff. So they were having a good time. Um, but you can see, it's just a beautiful, beautiful area. And we had, fortunately, we had a great day. Um, about four, four hours from Mount Cook, that was our next major stop, was a place called Christ Church, which you've probably heard of. Its nickname is the Garden City. I'm going to say it's about the size of Rochester, maybe a little bigger. Um, and it was it was a really stunningly beautiful city. I mean, just the way it was laid out, um, a lot of gardens, a really stunning botanical garden on the lower on the two lower pictures were of there. And, um, you know, big specimen trees and a little river going through it where you could, you know, get a little kayak and go along. Um, beautiful museums and restaurants and just a really nice, just the, the urban planning there was, was really very thought, well thought out. Um, the Canterbury Museum is at the lower right. You can kind of see it in the background. And that was, a, um, they had an exhibit of New Zealand jade which is known as Greenstone. And um, the Maori people, the indigenous people, did carve that for implements and for jewelry. And um, these were quite highly valued and were passed through generations. So there was a very nice display of them in there. And these are some, well, just kind of street scenes. Um, you can see they have a tram system that actually goes right through the middle of I guess you'd call it like a open air mall to the left. Um, I, I didn't see any trams, but I think you'd have to be a little careful there because it really does go right through the middle of where people are hanging out. Um, and they, they had very interesting murals there. I, I took a couple pictures because they were just large and interesting. So, and um, New Zealand is, as I mentioned, is on the ring of fire. And it's right in the middle of it, you know. Um, you can see on this little graphic here that Milford Sound is literally right on that fault. But you can see all these little black sub faults that are there and how much they move per year. And also Christ Church. I mean, really, basically, all of the North and South Islands are, are pretty much right on a major fault. Um, and when we were there, although we didn't feel any earthquakes, um, there was a swarm, as they called it, of 22 earthquakes in 20 days north of Auckland, which is on the North Island, kind of in that the bay-looking area up there. So, um, but I think we were maybe fortunate we couldn't feel them. And um, Topa, which looks like Popo, but they pronounce it Topa, um, is also, uh, well, you'll see more about that, but that's a highly volcanic area. So you can't really talk about Christchurch without talking about the earthquakes that they suffered in 2010 and especially in 2011. Um, they were kind of, they're kind of lumped together. And we went to, um, there's a thing called Quake City, which is a um, museum there that describes the earthquakes. It was, it was really well done. There was a lot of, you know, firsthand footage, but also, um, you know, people telling their stories of what happened in about 40 seconds during that second and the worst earthquake. Um, they're still rebuilding all these years later. 
um, the at the bottom you can see the before and after of their major cathedral downtown and that entire clock tower went um and you know they're still rebuilding you know you have to remember this is a this is a country of five million people it's not like they have all the means in the world um another thing that happened which um i didn't know anything about it was they had and this was really a problem during the earthquake a thing happened that was called liquefaction which is basically if you're if you're on sand in particular it's sort of you have to imagine if um if you fill a wheel, wheelbarrow with cement with wet cement and then run down to the end of your driveway and back you know you're going to have a lot of water come out of it you're going to have it separate and that's literally what happened to the ground under Christ Church was the shaking of the ground caused water silt mud to kind of bubble up and destabilize hundreds of homes and businesses so in addition to the immediate damage to the buildings that came down there was also this liquefaction and you know i think they had to, i think it was something like 10,000 structures had to be taken down because of instability um so that actually was a bigger problem i think so you know today you will see vacant lots and it's a little odd um you know it's not like you see sometimes you see water where it doesn't belong like in this wreckage of a building which was you know it was kind of boarded up but i put my camera over the top and just took a picture and that's what was there so um so you know and it was a shame because christ church is is a beautiful city but i imagine it was in an even more beautiful city before the earthquake so after christ church a day in christ church we flew up to rotorua which is on the north island and um people say it smells like rotten eggs because it's very volcanic up here uh, a lot of thermal springs um, and they're everywhere um, this is on the north island and, and you can see my husband he's walking through this is actually a, a little free park in the middle of rotorua um called what was it called karai i think it was pronounced karai um and it's just there they are the thermal springs and they're they're everywhere some are much more colorful and beautiful than others um and this is a touristy area rotorua um you know you can find a lot of these thermal springs for free and for pay if you want if you, just for soaking you know people like to soak in the springs so the city the small city that smells like rotten eggs um the first thing we did when we got there other than land was to go to a Maori hangi, I think is how it's pronounced. And Maori looks like Maori, but we got corrected very quickly when we started calling it Maori. So it is pronounced Maori. Um, and I found there was a large Maori influence in the North Island in particular. Um, you know, the languages, the language you, you hear spoken still, and also the names of places, you know, can be difficult for our sensibilities um there was this <laughs> uh this one place we stayed and i have no idea how to pronounce it exactly but i'll spell it it was it was spelled n-g-o-n-g-o-t-a-h-a and i think it was something like nyang nyang taha but um you know you see a lot more of that it seems in the north island and um, a hangi is an evening meal, usually lamb, chicken, potatoes, and sweet potatoes, and they cook it over hot rocks. They don't so much have, you know, traditionally they didn't have ovens, but they had volcanoes. So they would just lower them down into the ground and it would cook their food. Um, we, it was like a, a, a thing where there was maybe 200 people or whatever for this thing. And um, they performed song and dance and tradition, did a traditional welcome, which is quite elaborate um we went out in the forest and they they brought by this war canoe that you can see in the lower right and kind of were singing songs and and, and um doing things with the paddles you know like kind of touching the paddles and um and this is uh this was in a very nice forest natural forest um they showed us agility exercises um especially uh the lower left there that was um that was to help actually strengthen their wrists 
So who knew? Um, and then after dinner, um, if you wanted to, and we did, we went out back to the forest when it was dark. And what we didn't realize, um, New Zealand has a lot of these glowworm caves where they're little larval flies, but they, for about three days, two to three days, when they're in the larval state, um, they kind of shine blue. They're, they're bright blue. They're small and they don't blink or anything. So, um, what I didn't know is that they live in the forest too. So when we went out there in the dark, they were in the forest and it was really, again, very magical, very fairy like almost, you know, to see all these little blue lights. Um, not far from Rotorua is also Hobbiton. And Hobbiton is where they made the uh, Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings movies when they needed hobbits in their houses. So <clears throat> I guess this is about two hours from Rotorua. And um, there are also day trips that you can take from Auckland to Hobbiton and to areas down here. So it's not too far from there. Um, and Peter Jackson actually went by helicopter and found this area. It's not like right on the road. You have to take a bus in for 20 minutes or so, and then you, you go around it with a, a guide. Um, and the first set that they did for the Lord of the Rings movies was temporary, as you would expect. And um, But then the farmer, who had a sheep farm here, um, then they decided to make the Hobbit movies. And I think there were three of those. So they came back and said, well, can we rebuild this? And make the Hobbit movies here. And he said, yeah, but I want you to make it last 50 years so I can turn it into a tourist tourist stop. So that's what he did. But it's, um, you learn a lot about movie magic here. And it was really a charming little place. It's, you know, it's a fantasy world, but um, but it was, it was, it was a fun thing to do. This is more of Hobbiton. You can see kind of the whole village laid out there from the top. Um, and of course, lots of sheep. And evidently, um, New Zealand has white faced sheep and England has black faced sheep. So, you know, I guess Peter Jackson in his, his exacting way, um, flew in 150 black feet, black faced sheep just for the filming. So, yeah. Um, but you can just see it's cute. And then to the lower right is, is kind of some of the typical landscape there. It's, it's odd. Like there's hills and big rock, rock outcroppings. And you really can tell that this is volcanic, even though it doesn't look like volcanoes. It's just the, the land is disrupted. So I tried to take a quick shot from the car. And why Tapu, I think is how it's pronounced is one of the thermal springs that you pay to go see. And um, it's like a mini Yellowstone is I guess the only way to describe it. You've got all these colorful pools um, and you know, again, it all smells like rotten eggs and mineral deposits. And it's, it's a very interesting place to walk around. This one's called the Artist's Palette, close one, the one that's yellow and green. And in the back, I think is a champagne pool, which um, is quite large. It's, it's a little, distorted because I was trying to get everything in. And here are more pictures from that. Um, the waterfall, it just has a lot of mineral deposits on it. Um, and then this, this Lady Knox geyser, they actually, um, it goes off at 1030 every day, but it's not, it, it, well, let's put it this way. They make it go off at, nine, at 1030 every morning. Um, this used to be, before it was a tourist attraction, it was a penal colony and, and, you know, but it was kind of natural. So the, the inmates could go out and wash their clothes in the warm water and, you know, so <laughs> story goes that they, that they were washing their clothes and somebody just threw a little bit of soap to the side and this geyser erupted and they literally just ran in their skivvies because of course, when you're on volcano land, you don't know how big that eruption is going to be. Um, so, what they do to induce an eruption is they they basically so so they throw soap in there like detergent dry soap and it changes the surface um i, I you know i'm not i wish i knew my my uh, chemistry better but the, the the surface 
chemistry has changed in a way that causes this to erupt. So it takes about five minutes after they throw the soap in and the eruption lasts, it gets maybe about 30 feet high and then it settles down to about 10 or 12 feet and lasts about two hours. And they do this every day. And here's some of the really wild colors. These are not enhanced that, um, that you see there, that one pool that looks like lime jello or something, I don't know. And, you know, just very unusual colors and deposits. And there's a lot of these places. Wild Tapu is not the only one. There's, there's a lot of them. So this is just a little of the flora and fauna. Um, I'm standing in front of a Totara tree, which um, there aren't as many as there used to be. And um, this is in the South Island, though, but they grow commonly in the North Island, which is more tropical. Um, and it's one of the largest uh, trees there are. This was an easy walk in, believe it or not. It was about a 10 minute easy walk in. Uh, and then this, you know, these are like silver ferns or other kinds of ferns in the forest. It's, you know, it, it looks quite different. It's definitely more tropical than the South Island. And then this um, this little guy here is a pukeko, which is um, about the size of a hen, you might say. And they're very friendly, except they do like to turn around when you take pictures, I found. So the next place we went on the map here is Topa. And Topa is about, oh, hour and a half maybe from Rotorua. And this is the scene of um, the biggest volcano ever in the world, actually. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, but Hookah Falls is, uh, it's, it's really a channel of water that comes in and they open a gate and it just comes gushing out a couple times a day. Um, of course, we're kind of used to Niagara Falls. So, you know, I got to say it's not Niagara Falls, but it was worth going to. And it's right there in the town. It's easy to get to. So Topa had um, two major eruptions. Um, uh, this is a picture of a sign I took, and it, it shows the ash cloud cover. And if you're measuring ash, it was the largest eruption ever recorded uh, 26,000 years ago. Um, and it shows you the ash clouds. And then they had another one 1,800 years ago. And then you can see Mount St. Helens is down there looking pretty puny compared to what these were. So Topa is um, a major volcano. <laughs> it's actually more than one. Um, I think there's two or three there, but they, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, and it's still active. I mean, you can't see lava, but it's, it's an active volcano. You see smoke and, you know, that kind of thing that you know, okay. So, um, if you saw the armchair tourist things, you might have seen the Tongariro crossing and were wondering, like, what's the big deal here? Well, supposedly the Tongariro um, Alpine crossing, as they call it, is one of the best walks um, in New Zealand and maybe even in the world. And it it takes probably between, I'm going to say, six to eight hours to do. Um, we boarded a bus to take us there at about 5.30 in the morning, got there about 7. and we had a cloudy day. <laughs> so, you know, it, it wasn't rainy, but the higher we went, the cloudier it got. So um, this is literally, um, if you know the Lord of the Rings movies, this is a walk into Mount Doom. This is where they filmed Mount Doom. And you can see why, because it's quite forbidding. Um, and there's two volcanoes that you walk between. And there's some uh, beautiful emerald colored lakes up there and some blue lakes. Um, it was rigorous, you know, I think you go up, well, you go up maybe 2,500 feet and it's a long down. It's about 3,600 feet down. And that was actually, for me, the harder part was walking down for so long. Um, I think we had about five weather changes. Um, when we were started, it was about 60 degrees. At the top, it was very windy and 33 degrees. And then it rained for an hour at the tail end of the hike. So, <laughs> you know, um, and they, they, they kind of warn you. They say they have a, a light and if there's volcanic activity, they will close this. They won't let you go up. So I don't know what happens if you're on there and you have volcanic. I mean, you just, you're just 
toasted. I mean, I, that's all I can say. You, you just don't have a chance. So this is kind of what we could see. We could see maybe about 300 feet. Um, I would say the winds at the top were maybe 30 miles an hour. I mean, you know, kind of slamming into one ear. Um, and there was a lot of walking, the lower left you can see, walking around these volcanic rocks. Um, so it wasn't easy. I mean, I had walking sticks and they did have places where they had, um, you know, like a rope or, or chains that you could hold on to, which was actually very helpful. Um, and, you know, there were some places where, particularly coming down the other side of a very steep peak where it was like, um, I guess you call it scree or it was, it was, it was loose volcanic rock and you literally just would plant a foot and go another two feet. So it was almost like you were sliding down the hill. Um, so honestly, we kind of had all the work, but none of the rewards, but we were proud to be able to do it. So um, I want to show you what we didn't see because this is what we went to see is this kind of thing. So as you can see, it's absolutely stunning on a nice day. <laughs> so, um, we, we thought if we ever get back to New Zealand, we would do it again, but we would only do it on another, on, on a good day. We would not bother otherwise. And this is some more pictures I got. You can kind of see that, you know, that walking on the ledge there, which really you don't want to go off either side there because there is nothing to prevent you from kind of sliding down a ways. Um, I think they rescue about 80 people a year from here. And then they had these really beautiful little alpine daisies. Um, not so little, they were probably about eight inches big. Um, and it was very hard to take pictures because there's so much mist and, and a lot of mist on the lens as well. So, um, but eventually we did get kind of get below the clouds on the way down and you can see kind of the, the vistas there. Um, at the upper right, that's a fumarole, that's smoke. It's uh, basically opened up a few years ago and destroyed a hut. Um, so um, there are places where they kind of tell you to move along and that hut is one of them. It's the only real big hut along the way. There are like porta potties, but that's the only place, that's where everybody has lunch. Um, but they say, don't, don't hang out there too long um, because they just never know. Um, there aren't too many places to rest, really. You, know, you just kind of keep walking. Um, they also, uh, on the way down, there was an area where they have, they could have lahars, which is basically boiling mud that would come down through, um, usually it comes through where there's a stream or something. So, you know, they had a sign there that said, you know, like move quickly through this area and if you hear rumbles, run. And I'm just like, you know, I've been walking for six hours and I, I'm not gonna run, but I might've, I don't know if I'd heard a rumble. It was kind of funny. I should, I should have taken a picture of the sign. So here's more Tangriro. You can see the the um, the the path, the, the actual track that you use is actually really well maintained. Um, you know, it's not slippery. They put down this mesh stuff. Um, there's heather up there that was very pretty. Um, but um, I would recommend it on a good day. Let's put it that way. So then we drove up to Auckland for again a day <laughs> um and uh this this really beautiful view is from the sky tower it's the highest tower you 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 probably recognize it if you've ever seen any of the um i think i have pictures but not of the whole um cityscape um you can see in the background like straight in the back a little to the left but that that's actually an uninhabited um volcanic island yeah you know just off in the distance and we found you could spend a lot of time here because there are so many islands and ferries you can take and little inlets and you know it's a very cosmopolitan city, a really expansive harbor. Um, and there are a lot of beaches further north from here, all over New Zealand really, but we didn't even make it to beaches much. But north of here, there are some really stunning beaches which we didn't have time for. This is just a street entertainer playing an instrument. I'm not sure what it's called. And uh, Christmas decorations, of course, which is just a little odd because we're used to it being cold. Uh, but just some street scenes. 
And then the last picture I have is uh, the Sky Tower, which I think is 750 feet. And at the bottom of it, there's like something that looks like a little bigger than a boxing ring. And at the top, they have this controlled, I guess you call it a controlled bungee jump, where, you know, you're, they let you down, but they do it at a controlled speed. But you do go down 750 feet onto this little platform where you just kind of let your knees give and you stand up. So um, I debated for a short period of time and then decided, well, maybe we don't have time for that. So, okay. Um, that's pretty much what I have. I wanted to let people know, though, that I will be doing um, a travelogue on Nicaragua on June 18th, same time, 7 o'clock. That's two weeks from today. So you can register there if that's something that would interest you. And now maybe we can have questions, discussions, all that stuff. I've been talking for a long time here. <laughs> How long were you there for, Joy? We were there for three weeks. Nice. Yeah. Because going to both islands in particular, you know, we it was a busy time. We didn't really have an off day, you know. We were doing right. something kind of every day. I had typed in a question. I don't know if it showed up. Um, did when you went to Mount Cook, did you have any issues with the altitude, with um, altitude sickness, or? It being so high up that um, you felt like there wasn't enough oxygen in the air? No, because we didn't climb up Mount Cook. Okay, so the, yeah, wherever we the of it. so wherever you're going isn't that high? Um, it doesn't have to be. Let's put it that way. I, I don't think, you know, the glacier is going to be lower. Like if you're going to take the helicopter to the glacier, which you can do, and I think that would be interesting. I mean, otherwise, you've got to climb the glacier yourself, which I think is pretty rigorous for most people. Um, but, you know, it's not that high up. So I don't think you, I didn't have any altitude. I didn't notice anything. One of the places we were going to stop was, um, there's like a, almost like a small, like, ski lodge looking place um, right at almost the base of Mount Cook. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. We're gonna drive in like you i guess there's this one road that drives all the way into mount cook and at the end of that road is this ski lodge um yes, like, and I think they call it mount cook village yeah 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 that's it's where we were pronounced our or something it's it's, it's also got a, a maori name that's hard to pronounce so you didn't have any issues with the altitude then no not at all okay did Very you go up, did you ever go up through the pass um arthur's pass no we didn't get up there that's further north and still west it's it's north of uh, mount cook not too far from Christchurch. you know you could do that i mean that would be a way to go it's supposed to be beautiful um julie i i would just say if you're going in the summer it's winter there and that can get very dicey with um with uh you, you need chains on your tires that kind of thing you'd have to be careful depending on what time of year you went yeah definitely that was another question of mine but i wasn't going to ask you because you went in their summer we were planning to go in their winter and my friends in christchurch said we'd probably be okay because we were going in the end of july through the first two weeks in august and they said that that's kind of the very very beginning of some of their spring but Mm -hmm. And it looked like the roads that we were going to go on to get to Mount Cook were the main roads. And so they said, if you want to go like off the trails, if you want to go the smaller roads, you might need chains, but the main road should be okay. Yeah. What do you think? I, well, I, I, you know, I, did, I didn't go there at that time. You probably I, should research it, I guess is what I, I'd say. I have been, I've been there at that time and you, you have to worry about avalanches and, things like that, depending on what the weather is. So, and I'm talking, I went mid to late July. So what was your experience with their winter? How did it compare to here?